Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Antonio. I'm Sophia. I'm Brandon. I'm Rose. I'm Shaha Rose. I'm Cecilia. I'm Alex. And I'm Luke. So what if I told you So what if I told you one of the safest places to give birth is in a refugee camp? Refugee camps are known for having numerous barriers to, uh, to care, but in the country of Jordan and within the Zatari refugee camp, lies the Women and Girls Comprehensive Center, which provides care for Syrian refugees uh, and does so with incredible success. As of early this year, uh, as of earlier this year, 14,000 babies have been delivered with zero maternal deaths. Now, while we recognize that there may be some similar barriers to care for the Zatari camp as those experienced by refugees elsewhere, we also understand that there are similar barriers um, but the barriers for the Rohingya people and the Kutupalong are unique. Nevertheless, we believe that many of these same uh, simple and inexpensive practices can be successfully implemented uh, right there in Cox Bazaar. Some have already been used as uh, by the Hope Foundation, and they use this golden chain uh, model, which implies unbroken pregnancy care within, uh, from contraception to birth, from conception to birth. And it's Atari. With support of the UNFPA, midwives have been absolutely uh, absolute access and control, and they're able to go door to door, providing prenatal care, and set a minimum standard of four prenatal visits per patient. But in reality, they're able to deliver 20 prenatal visits. Um, and while this is uh, ambitious, we believe this is possible. Uh, we're contributing with a very low maternal uh, mortality ratio and through interventions uh, focused on building trust and education. So Rohingya women within the Kutupalong refugee camp have three major barriers that stop them from receiving maternal health care, them being uh, political, structural, and cultural challenges. Sorry about that. Um, and these, cult these barriers lead to three major causes of death, them being a delay in seeking care, a delay in reaching health care facilities, and a delay in receiving care when they're at their health care facilities. All right, so knowing that these major factors account for deaths in the camp and incorporating the practices and suggestions from the Zotari camp, we have come up with a multi-pronged set of interventions that address problems at every stage of a pregnancy. So we're gonna start at the prenatal period. This is where we come directly to the people through the use of a mobile team consisting of a midwife, Navigator, traditional birthing attendant, and community healthcare worker, we plan to strategically maneuver throughout the camp on foot with the goal of providing services to these pregnant women at home. These services include educational materials, especially for warning signs that indicate the need for outside intervention, including uh, or as well as data collection and vitals that can be used to indicate any high risk factors. In cases of extreme emergencies, field packs that are carried by our midwives, have the tools for emergency births, including telehealth access to specialist physicians through a mobile tablet connected through a Starlink. So our next intervention targets the beginning of labor when moms may need to be transported throughout the very rough terrain of this camp. We will have a two-member team that traverses the main drivable roads with a special transport truck. They get as close as they can, and from that point, they go on foot with a collapsible, customized wilderness stretcher that prioritizes privacy and efficiency. And once they get back to the truck, the transport team can then carry mom all the way to the nearest healthcare center, which takes us to our next intervention. Uh, at the healthcare center is where we implement our labor interventions. So this is going to come in three parts, three components, education, outreach, and facilities improvement. Uh, the education will inform counter, uh, in, 
have information about counterproductive or harmful practices performed by traditional birthing attendants, as well as infection and sanitation, sanitation training for midwives and triage training to prioritize care and establish when outside help might be needed. This will lead to our next part, which talks about telehealth outreach using that same Starlink system that our mobile unit teams use. Our midwives will be able to contact uh, our outside partners. This will be local uh, partners within the Rohingya camp and some partners here in Pittsburgh uh, for particularly difficult births where they may need some help. Uh, the last part of our intervention here will include facility improvements guided by a lot of uh, cultural humility. This is gonna range from things like more welcoming and private spaces to build trust, as well as some technological improvements, including incubators and autoclaves for sanitation of equipment. Finally, to address the issues during the postpartum time of a pregnancy, we will have immediate care training for providers and educational components for mothers. The training for providers will focus on immediate postpartum data collection, as well as attention to warning signs for things like hemorrhaging, a common cause for death here in the camp. Uh, the educational components for mothers are going to include information on hygiene, future family planning, and nutrition, including training given by a lactation consultant. For our pilot phase, we have chosen the Kutupalong camp in the northeastern side of the Kutupalong expansion site. Um, we are gathering data to see what the radius one mobile can cover. And for the expansion year, we are doubling the area of the coverage by the pilot and moving to adjacent camps south and west towards 1E and 2E because those areas have the least coverage of health facilities. So January through October of our first year is what we're calling phase O. This is our observation period, and we will be um, conducting data collection through on-ground focus groups and interviews with mothers and other family members in the community. The participants will be compensated for their time. Additionally, during this time, we'll be establishing connections with local community leaders, like traditional birth attendants and religious leaders, and um, establishing support groups. The first 10 months of our observation period spans both the monsoon and the dry seasons so that we can evaluate the needs of the people during both of these times. These 10 months also include all of our preparation for the pilot phase, like training, hiring, ordering supplies, um, and establishing connections with the community. Our first year pilot begins after the monsoon season and implements all of our health interventions within the Kudapalong RC. In the second year, based on the data that we had covered, we plan to expand our area um, two times for the second year expansion. And in the last three months, we are dedicated to evaluating our data so far for future expansion and funding, as well as transferring leadership to the locals to leave the program as self-sufficient as possible. The, um, yeah. the end goal of all these interve interventions is to eventually transfer the maternal health care autonomy to the Rohingya women within the camp. And by doing this, um, through this plan, we're giving the refugees the opportunity to create their own sustainable health care infrastructure. On our budget, <clears throat> we've broken it down into the observation period, the pilot period, and the expansion period. Um, you'll notice with all three, there's a, high, there's a high cost when it comes to personnel, but we believe this cost is justified because our innovations require trained staff um, along with the um, resources they need in order to provide the uh, level of care we're hoping for. Uh, despite the high cost, we've actually come in under budget by uh, about 10.5%, which allows us to have extra funding in terms uh, to cover things like inflation or other um, unforeseen issues. So we believe the potential success of our outreach program and family planning efforts will reduce the uh, maternal mortality rate and help curtail the growing birth rate of nearly 100 babies a day. By building trust within the community and expanding and already implemented evidence-based practices, we hope to reach more people in need. Investments in infrastructure, technology, and expansion of wash services are essential to our future plans, but our most valuable investment will always be to empower the people we aim to serve. Thank you. Right, right under time, we have uh, six minutes for questions now. 
So is Whitney going first? Yeah. yeah. Okay, go ahead, Whitney. Um, wow, that was a great presentation. Um, I think the first question that comes to mind, do you guys have a goal for how many antenatal care visits you want to get per, per pregnancy, you know, per each lady who's pregnant? Thank you for the question. Um, we know 20 is very lofty, especially starting out and considering the um, the political climate currently in Bangladesh. Um, but I think we would like to start at four and build up from there. And I think we should be able to accomplish and uh, make a difference. Again, we were only working in a limited terrain, going door to door, and we know that will take time as well. Thank you. Okay, I'll go, I'll go next. Thanks for the presentation, great job. Um, my question, uh, where is it? Yeah, my question had to do with the telehealth um, being incorporated into the, the plan. Uh, two things. Can you rely on Elon Musk to actually supply Starlink to you for the, the entire period of the program? And then additionally, and, and on a more serious note, in these critical moments where the telehealth is actually deemed as necessary to bring in experts, how are you ensuring that there's actual um, a, a crossing of the language barrier in these moments to enable those that are in the situation to actually receive the uh, the expertise. Okay, the first question. Um, we do know that these are being used in uh, Ukraine right now, and these are being used for international communication from Ukraine. So they are reliable. Um, I mean, if that's in a wartime, something like a refugee camp, I think that's pretty transferable. Um, for the second question, could you remind me of the, the highlight, what you asked? Yeah, just um, how are you ensuring that there's no language barrier in these critical moments when telehealth is actually needed? Right. Um, so I think this is going to really come down to those connections that we build with our um, healthcare staff and our facilities. If you're having international workers as well as local um, local workers, there should be a lot of people who who can speak multiple languages. So really knowing who your staff is and relying and, and leaning on those strengths is I think where you're going to have to um, having that work done up front is going to provide any uh, prevent any issues there. Yeah, I don't think um, here we so we also have uh, planned here. Not sure if it's this slide, but we've taken into account uh, language competency, and so we're going to make sure that we're able to communicate with the staff, not only in English for our locals here and uh, your partnerships here in the U.S., but as well as making sure that the midwives are fully trained and are able to communicate clearly with the Haruhinja themselves. Yeah, I wanted to follow up on the uh, the, the uh, telehealth question. The uh, what is the existing communications um, from the camp now uh, do we, we have insights about you know what do they uh, what I just don't understand I, I don't know what how, what what what's happening right now so telehealth is uh, available in some clinics and hospitals they do have international partnerships currently hope hospital is one of them however communications are limited especially for staff uh, and the Rohingya people themselves uh, issues with uh, cellular communication being cut off uh, in some parts of the camp uh, after a certain time frame and so we believe having this mobile unit um, bypasses the need for cell towers kind of gives us some our own independence to be able to deliver care reliably, especially for those high risk pregnancies where maybe a wife uh, wants to consult. Uh, and uh, we have a partnership with uh, the Midwife Center here in Pittsburgh as well, um, in addition to UPMC McGee's Hospital and UPMC um, McGee's Research Institute, which we think are very powerful. You mentioned entities. That there was a Starlink. Could you tell me what who, who runs that? I don't I'm, I don't know how that's run. Um, the Starlink was designed by Elon Musk and the general. So, so, it, is, so it wasn't. Uh, all right. Uh, right. 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 Clear, clear. It's not the technology I'm questioning. It's the person. OK. okay. <laughs> and so um, because Twitter is potentially going bankrupt, we think he needs to maintain those other investments. We hope that that will work. But Starlink is not the only type of device. Uh, luckily, um, it just happens to be one that is being used in the Ukraine successfully. Um, it's the one seen on the right. It's very small, lightweight, compatible, just a little bit larger than the laptop. So our outreach navigator can carry it. Uh, we have uh, uh, portable batteries that can uh, power it. So. Okay. 
I don't have a question. I just want to um, thank you for taking into account the community. I really appreciate that. Some of you know that already. Okay, we have time for one more question. Oh, okay. Oh. Whitney? Whitney, Jim, she does. Oh, you're muted. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So I'm just curious because it's really difficult to navigate a refugee camp like have you considered like how you're going to map you know this out is that connected to the starlink um yeah how are you how are you mapping this out and then how are you how are you collecting your data so part of mapping it out is really during that observation period working with the locals and creating um our own database when it comes to uh, where these pregnancies are, where they're located, and um, how is the quickest route to get access to them. Um, and to build on that, on our uh, mobile unit teams, one of the people that we definitely made sure to include was what we call a navigator. Um, this is somebody whose job it is on the team is to pay attention to where they're at, to note where they're at and to note any uh, things that they might need in the surrounding locations, like uh, wash services, water, things like that. Um, so there is somebody designated on these mobile, uh, you know, foot teams for that. Thank you very Great much. Great timing. Thank you guys. <laughs>